I, um, I actually just got back. Uh, we had the world, we had the U, United States premiere in uh, New York last night. So I flew back in. Um, so I will give this one advisory now, which is okay. there is no movie I've seen more in my time at Paramount. <laughs> um, I have in the last two weeks been to Beijing, Vatican City, New York City, and Las Vegas. Um, so I won't be staying through the movie. I, we understand. Just, it's okay. <laughs> that, is not a, that is not a testament of my uh, enjoyment of the film. But at this point, I will. Do you recommend everybody see it as many times as you've seen it or not? That would actually be a very good thing. <laughs> I, then I may, I could last, if that were to happen, I might last in my job as long as Vin Scully has lasted in his. There you go. That's a pretty good goal to be seeking. So I saw you up there sort of caricatured in the... Um, uh, into in the uh, editorial cartoon. I thought that must mean you've actually arrived when you make it into an editorial cartoon in the LA Times. Well, you know, when we started this process with Noah, um, I went to a Hillsong conference and, and presented a, the first piece of audiovisual material. And they introduced me as one of the most influential Christians in Hollywood. I now realize I've become one of the, if not the most infamous Christian in Hollywood. I think this is where I'm going to end up by Monday. So as I was listening to you talk and, and thinking about all that you all have gone through with this movie, and I think as you, we talked a little bit during the reception, you certainly didn't anticipate this kind of a reaction to it. But from a leadership perspective, as one of the senior leaders in the organization, as that began to happen, how did you approach that from a leadership perspective, both the team and then you personally, to begin to think about how do we deal with this? You know, it's interesting. Um, as I said, in 2005, Brad Gray asked me to come and, and work with him as he was looking to rebuild Paramount. And he's definitely been somebody who creatively is willing to take big gambles. And this was definitely a movie that, as you'll see, is very ambitious from a production standpoint and from a storytelling standpoint. So it always helps when your boss is giving you that support. And then I think relative to me and leading the organization and the team that works for me in terms of the marketing and the distribution of the movie, it is about picking a place and a target for success and aiming for it. And at times, you see people when things start to get tough, they tend to want to stay out of the limelight and not want to be in the line of fire as it would be. And so I think that is the key moment when leadership really kicks in is when there are tough times and there are challenges the organization sees where you're headed. And, and I did see success for this movie. I did see an audience for it. There were definitely times along the way that that might not have been so certain. Um, but certainly now as we've started to get a number of the reviews in, we've had a lot of, of very strong reviews, although some controversial. Time Magazine, actually their review posted today, and it actually says the movie is better than the book. <laughs> now, I'm sure there's a number of people who are going to take exception to that. Yeah, as that'll be a little controversial a as a title, yes. But it does go to this conversation about the story of Noah and the story of Noah in Genesis and how flushed out it is or is not, and some of the the storytelling gambles truly in this film. And, and like I said, there are definitely elements of the film that are surprising. Um, as I said, relative to Glenn Beck, who we showed the movie to on Saturday, that there was definitely elements of Noah's journey that he didn't connect to and that, that he took exception to. And I think that was the key. As I said, I'm totally fine. People, once you've seen the movie, having your exceptions with it and truly looking at it in terms of your own beliefs and really being able to therefore talk articulately about it, even if you're telling somebody why you don't, why you didn't like it. That I think, again, the conversations that it leads to are certainly very unique. Um, and so certainly in terms of this film, that element of leadership and guiding folks to a destination that hopefully will be successful. Fortunately, we had the equivalent of a a mini opening last week, we actually started the rollout in Korea and Mexico. Both markets did um, fantastic. Um, just, we're always looking at movies that are similar in genre and audience. So like Gravity was 
Oscar nominated, went on to gross 700 million worldwide um, with George Clooney and, and Sandra Bullock. That NOAA in both Mexico and Korea opened bigger than gravity opened. Uh, we opened Australia, I guess there yesterday or today, um, where it did very well. And then the early results, and we'll have these first thing in the morning from Russia, that actually looks like it may be the best market for the film of any market uh, in terms of how big it's going to open, that it could do north of $10 million this week and from Russia. So. Why would you think, what's your thinking of why that would do so well in Russia? Because, I mean, it's an interesting market for a film like this to do so well in. So do you have a thesis behind why that would be the case? You know, it's interesting. Some of the countries, you know, certainly Mexico, Brazil, the tracking looks very strong, and there's definitely been a, a real passion for the movie in, in some of the countries with a significant Catholic population. Russia culturally really likes movies that are action-adventure. They like movies that are period, epic drama, and so they see it as an action-adventure movie. And so different people in different places respond to it differently, but I think in terms of that door it opens is certainly something that's turning into a global conversation. Um, as we saw when there was a lot of debate about whether the Pope was gonna screen the movie or not, that turned into a global conversation that Russell Crowe was in Brazil. They were asking about seeing the Pope and meeting the Pope. And, and so that, that, again, that conversation that's been taking place has just been very interesting to watch develop. So kind of back to the leadership question, for your perspective personally as a leader, what have you learned from this experience that you've gone through that might change the way you think about leadership in the future or reinforce the things that you think are important about leadership? Have you had some sort of personal insights that have come from this for you in the role that you have? Well, I think the most important dynamic of being a leader is you can't be afraid to fail. Because if you are, then that usually is what happens instead. And I think this has certainly been a real opportunity for fear and failure. And that willingness to believe in your team and believe in your goal, even though along the way there may be times where it doesn't seem so obvious that it's going to work out. And I think that is ultimately the true responsibility of a leader in the organization is to continue to, to drive folks ahead even though you don't know quite how it's gonna work out, but not being afraid to fail and try. And I think at times people get reluctant to, to take on a new challenge because they are afraid that they don't know exactly how it's gonna work out. Now, this movie may have been a bigger challenge than I originally expected, but. Well, and in this industry, a failure can cost hundreds of millions. I mean, it can be a big failure from a financial perspective. So, you know, I, watching all these clips up here, there's, you've got a wide diversity of movies coming out in the coming year that appeal to many different audiences. How do you go about making those decisions about which of those you're going to launch and think are going to be successful? How much science is there to it? How much art? How much, you know, praying every night that it works effectively? Uh, do you go through? Well, there's a couple different um, processes. So as I mentioned, Adam Goodman, who um, is the person responsible for the creative development, the actual producing of the films. So his team is constantly hearing ideas, reading scripts, and, and bringing those to Brad Gray, whose responsibility is to, ultimately is the person who has to sign off on saying this is an investment worth making. And then the folks in my team are the responsible for generating the revenue. So ultimately, looking at the idea, looking at the script, looking at the casting and saying, what do we think this movie could do? So it's a combination of art and science that all come together um, on Brad Gray's plate and that ultimately, hopefully, uh, more often than not, the recommendations he's being given and his gut instincts are making good calls. Fortunately, as you talked about before I came up, we've, we've been on a very good run since Brad's been here. In fact, we've had a picture nominated for Best Picture every year since um, Brad has been here. So. We've had an amazing diversity of movies that have been big financial successes as well as some great creative successes. So when you looked at the real, going from a movie about Martin Luther King to a movie based upon the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So certainly it could not be a wider range of, of films. 
Well, I'm going to go to the audience now. Would you like to take some questions from the audience and see what they would like to hear about? Sure. All right. I think we have some microphones uh, out there. So if you would raise your hand and then someone with the microphone will find you and we'll see what questions we have from the audience. If you speak really loud, we can repeat the question so everybody can hear. So let me repeat the question. So the question is, there's a statement that there's no publicity, there's no, no publicity is bad publicity, and so does he think that there will be some positive things that come out of this in the end? Yeah, I'd say relative, we'll talk about the general comment and then the specific. I think in the world we live in now, information travels so quickly. We're good, the mics are live. Go ahead. All right, now we have lots of mics working. In the lobby, in the booth. Um, that information travels so quickly now that it's hard for sometimes people to differentiate between rumor and fact because the word spreads so fast. So you can have a misperception of the movie develop. And I think that was the one concern we had. And, and I read the, the poll that I didn't even take the story to the conclusion, which was six hours later, Variety pushed out a headline that said 98% of Christians unhappy with Noah. So at some point, that starts to go from rumor and controversy to branding to say, oh, well, this movie has significant problems, and therefore Christian groups are rallying around that you shouldn't see it. So you can have it turn into people perceiving its fact. I think in this case, it's led to a lot of conversation and debate about what is okay and was it, what isn't okay, and is it a good thing to have art inspired by the Bible? Some people weighing in strongly that it is a good thing. Um, and like I said, I think what we'll find is a lot of people find the movie engaging and inspiring, and some people will find it not to be something that they connect with. But you definitely can have the potential in the world we live in now where that can turn from publicity that makes people think about the movie to branding that says to people, this is something you don't want to see. That word of mouth now travels so quickly between everybody, how connected everybody is that that information just travels very quickly. I think the way we've seen the way it's developed as people have started to come into the conversation that it does feel like it just made it a conversation topic. And certainly we lived through last summer a very um, public conversation about a movie of ours with Brad Pitt called World War Z where there was a lot of conversation about the fact that we had to go back and reshoot a significant amount of the third act and whether or not that movie was going to be a failure or not. Now, fortunately, about $600 million worldwide later, it, it all worked out. So in that case, it certainly turned into curiosity of saying, well, how did they fix this? Is it a problem? And so my sense is that in this movie, it'll be some of the same of people wanting to understand what the movie's about and be able to be part of the conversation. And so that is my sense of where we're headed, but we will see in about 24 hours how that's playing out. So, uh, <laughs> so one of the things that makes me think about is there's, you do have so much going on in social media and it spreads so rapidly. How do you make decisions about which of those things to try to counter and respond to and which to just let them happen and hopefully they'll sort of die a quick death? Yeah, you certainly saw some of these things take hold. So the two that, that, for whatever reason, had the most traction is there was a review written by um, a gentleman who's a screenwriter who was reviewing a, a script that was before Paramount was involved, but there wasn't a lot of information. And, and given how quick things spread, we tend now to try and keep the scripts off the internet so people that haven't seen everything that's going to be happening in a film. And he had used the term environmental wacko to describe Noah in the film, or certainly in the script he'd read. So because there wasn't a lot of other information for a while, that started to 
get a lot of traction. So reaching out to people to have them look at the film and, and make their um, assessment of God's motivation in the film. So we did have somebody who provided us the quote that in fact, in Darren's Noah, God is acting based upon the wickedness of man, not based upon our lack of respect for our carbon footprint. So there are elements like that, or like with this, this survey that was published by Variety, at that point, that becomes viewed as fact, that other media outlets will pick up what Variety has said as feeling like they are a legitimate source of news for the entertainment industry. So for that one, we actually had to put out our own press release, which was very unusual to quote the National Research Group and the Barna Group in terms of what other research we had, because if we let that sit out there, then that would start to be what was picked up and people would start to repeat it. And so the one thing you definitely see is there can be things that come out of social media, get picked up by mainstream news, and then gets taken by other news outlets, and it becomes fact. And that's where you're dealing with, well, what's an important enough piece of information that we need to address and have folks comment who've seen the movie and hopefully folks of authority or people who are respected that will come into the conversation. Other questions from the audience? I see one right over here. Let, let's get you a microphone. I think we'll have one that will work this time. Hope so. Okay, hi. First of all, I'm a Christian and I'm really looking forward to seeing the film. I wanted to share that with you. And also, I work in the media with animals, television and, and radio. And I wanted to share with you also that the animal advocacy world is singing your praises for not using live animals in the films. Could you talk a little bit about Darren's decision to do that? Yeah, you know, it's been interesting, as I said, because of the fact that there was so much criticism leveled at the script for being an environmentalist treaty, that therefore that started turning into a negative, that one of the things Darren was inspired by was to tell a story about mankind not respecting God's creation, and that he was, he sent me a note. So Darren sent me a note when Pope Francis was doing his first address, and, in, and Darren was so captivated that one of the things that the Pope talked about was mankind's responsibility for stewardship. So Darren definitely is someone who part of what inspired him to make this story was about man's responsibility to God's creation and to respect the creatures that God has created. So he ultimately felt like the best way that he could create the animals for the movie is through CGI and then f through um, puppets. So we hosted a number of people on the Ark, which was built in Brooklyn, and people could walk through the Ark and see. And, and so he had created a combination of, of um, artificial animals that were populating the ark and then CGI animals as well. But certainly for him, that was important in terms of how the process was done. Other questions? Well, I'm also a Christian and I'm wondering if, if you think personally that this movie will turn anyone um, towards truth about God? Well, I think it's more about the opportunity for all of us, which is that there's a conversation you can rarely have with folks who aren't Christians. And this certainly, I have had more conversations about my faith and about God with non-believers over the last year as part of this movie than I probably had done the rest of the prior 50 years of my life. So it creates an opportunity to have conversation in a very organic and natural way that you couldn't otherwise normally have, where people might have some, some walls or some other obstruction. And this movie definitely lead, there is no question that this movie will provoke people. That we screened the film for Sam Rodriguez, who um, is a very influential Hispanic pastor. And he said to me, this movie's very disturbing, but in a good way both for non-believers and believers. It, the movie really deals with the consequence of sin and that it is a big deal and it is um, compelling and the way the movie treats it is that it ha there's a price. And so that is truly the door that this film can open. I don't think necessarily from seeing the film that, that that's what's gonna change someone's mind about the situation, but I think it, creates an opportunity that wouldn't otherwise exist for 
people who are believers to then share their faith and have conversations. It's very hard in your everyday life otherwise to see somebody who's now thinking about it, engaged in the conversation, and then that door is open. And I think that is definitely what I've seen from this film. We have time for a couple more questions from the audience because we want to make sure we have time to watch the movie. So <laughs> there's one up here. Or do you Hi, I'm an independent film producer. I just produced a movie with Kevin Sorbo, whose new movie, God's Not Dead, was number two on a purse screen average last weekend, God's Not Dead. I just wonder if Paramount would ever consider producing a full-out uh, Christian movie with the, in with the intent to really uh, minister to people, such as God's Not Dead. Yeah, I'm going to... Congratulations, by the way. It was very successful and, and um, you know, a great result. I would say no, that I think relative to Paramount and the organization and the corporation that ultimately, I think, you know, we get back to what I said at the beginning in terms of your best way into the movie business is through what your personal skill is and what your expertise is. And I think when you look at the broad organization, that isn't a skill set that most folks have, that ultimately... Noah, I think, combined the, combina the combination of a great filmmaker, great visual effects, big scale, something that was going to work on a global basis, and therefore it really took advantage of the skill sets that the Paramount organization has. But in terms of telling that story and being comfortable in understanding it, that's just not the skill set that most of the folks in the organization have. And I think those films that the independent film community has done a great job of creating and supporting them, and certainly as, as your results showed this weekend, that that was a spectacular result that the independent film world was able to support. And I think that will continue to be the dynamic because of there you have that freedom and that group of people who have that expertise, which just by and large doesn't exist inside of the, inside of the studios. Let's take one more question from the audience. Okay? I don't know where the, I'll let the microphone find you. There we go. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious, you've talked a lot about the external controversies, but have you seen any impact on this movie that has had internally within the culture of Paramount? Well, um, you know, there's been a couple times along the way where, unfortunately, the response has more been, why do we keep getting attacked by the Christian folks who haven't seen our movie? That seems counter to what that non-Christians are expecting from the Christian community. So I think, unfortunately, what we've seen a lot of, of people looking at the reaction from the Christian world and saying, huh, I thought that's the group who would be most excited that a movie inspired by the Bible would be the most excited for it. And that seemed to be the group attacking the film first and attacking the film without seeing it. And so I think it's led some people to really look and say, wow, what are the values that the Christian world is constantly talking about? We're not experiencing them in this, in this situation. I think that's the key on all of us is how do we, instead of looking and trying to figure out what's wrong with the film, because there's no question, there are things that people aren't going to like about the movie. The question is, this film exists. It is here. It's finished. It's, it's opening in hours. And therefore, the question is, we can either attack it for what's wrong with it, or we can look at it as an opportunity. And I think some of the early reactions were certainly people reacting out of their fear and concern of what the film might be. And that certainly led to some number of reactions of people being very surprised of assuming that the Christian world would be excited and supportive of a film like this. And I don't know that that's different than what we've seen with some other films that have come out with uh, biblical and spiritual themes in them. Let me close with this question. You sort of jokingly talked about wanting to have the longevity of Vince Scully or to take over his job at some point. But you have actually had really tremendous longevity in the entertainment industry and with the industry in general, but also in some specific companies. You were at Disney for 13 years. You've been here for 10 years. And that's a long time to be in a particular company in an industry and to be very successful in it. What, what has allowed you to have that kind of success and longevity? And, and what have you learned from that that might be helpful to others, whether it's in this industry or other industries, to sort of be able to sustain that level of commitment and success in a very difficult environment? 
Yeah, I think certainly, and it's it's easier when you talk about the movie business, but it is about having a business that you're passionate about, that you care about, that you like to immerse yourself in and talk about and spend your time engaging in it. And I think certainly, as I joked, um, yes, my childhood dream was to pursue a career in the sports broadcasting field. Um, I'm not sure if I've given it up yet, but you know, maybe we'll see when... If, if Finn Scully ever retires. Um, <laughs> but I think it is about the combination of, of finding out what you're best at and then finding an industry you're passionate about and combining the two. And I've had extreme luck in terms of being in great places and great companies that, as I said, I went to Disney right when that company was really being rebuilt um, truly from the ground up versus what had been done there. So there was a lot of opportunity. But again, it, that is a key element of it, which is being willing to take risks and put yourself into new situations once you've developed a skill set. And I think that's where I've had a lot of opportunity and taken a lot of risks in terms of getting into new things. As you said, my degree was in accounting. And I started with Arthur Anderson and was in their accounting division and then moved from that and kept building and, and developing different skill sets inside of the movie business. And so that's what's allowed me to continue to develop. And I think that's the most important thing is continue to challenge yourself and to continue to want to learn. And that there's learning done through textbooks, but there's also learning done in terms of reading and investigation and following trends. And I think that's what becomes very important as we live in a world where things are changing so fast that making sure that you're keeping up with developments and what's happening in the entertainment industry and in the movie industry, that becomes what really can lead you to continue to be somebody who is relevant and who can continue to lead as the industry evolves. And that you can't just learn one skill and stay with it. You have to keep learning and developing. And I think that's been a key part of what I've been part of. And then also learning from great people and finding people who are in your company who have more experience than you. And as I mentioned, um, Tom Sherrick, I was blessed to be able to spend 15 years with him. He's one of the smartest, most um, genuine men who have been in this industry. And I had the great fortune to be able to work with him and to sit on his couch and listen to him talk on the phone. And so there's elements like that, that key things that you don't really think about but finding opportunities to learn from other people in the company you're at. And that, that's something that at times people don't really focus on as a way you're learning, is learning from people who have a lot of experience that are around you. Well, we're going to do a little transition here in just a minute, but any last words you want to share with our audience as we prepare to screen Noah before its grand opening tomorrow? So. Uh, two things. The movie is two hours and 13 minutes long before the credits run. Um, and like I said, I think the most important thing is we all have a choice to make relative to the way we engage with this movie in general and or specifically in other movies in general, which is we can either look for what we don't like about it or we can look for the opportunity that it presents for us. And I think as we've seen this develop over the last six weeks, this is a movie that right now people are talking about. And so it goes back to the question about is any publicity good publicity? I think relative to for the folks in this room, and if folks who are passionate about their faith, this movie now is a movie that because of all the conversation is a movie people want to talk about. And so that's an opportunity you rarely get. And I think that is really the challenge for all of us is how do we use that opportunity? And not how do we pick apart Darren's movie? As I said, Darren is not a Christian. He's not claimed to be one. He was inspired by this movie because the story of Noah led him to be a filmmaker. And that's why he wanted to make the film. I had different reasons that it inspired me. And hopefully, in there is something valuable for, for most of the people who see it. Well, Rob, thank you for uh, sharing your uh, wisdom and insights with us and for sharing uh, the movie and the time and the studio with us. We really appreciate having you with us this evening. So thank, no, you. thank you. Thank you all.